All right. Good morning. Glad to have you here this morning. I'm Rory Nave. I'm the pastor here, if I haven't met you before. Uh, Frank's going to throw my email address up on screen. A couple of reasons for that. One is uh, you can email me and contact me. So if you've got questions or uh, wonder about our church or what we do here, you can email me using that email address on the screen, rory at fbcoakridge.org. For more immediate purposes, if Brandon says something that is just inane or confusing or wrong, and you just need to tell someone about it, I'm listening, okay? So you can email me, and I will, I will hear your heart. And maybe, maybe even I'll come up here and I'll tackle Brandon and, and, and hold him accountable for the things that you lay at his feet. Uh, more than likely, I'll probably just ask him a question, and then we'll have a good conversation about it. Uh, so I encourage you, if you've got questions during your Sunday school hour, um, uh, to send those to me, and I'll, I'll make sure Brandon hears them. And then maybe we can have a, a, a good conversation about it. In all honesty, we love it uh, when we get those questions coming in from you all. So uh, if you've got a question coming up on Romans chapter 8, which is your chapter for the day, um, be sure to email those to me and I'll pass them along to Brandon. Uh, one further announcement, uh, and then I'll, I'll get out of the way here. We are planning on having a uh, evening worship service tonight. Um, I think Tim titled it a sunset service, uh, which is appropriate. So 7 p.m. tonight. We're watching the weather very closely. It's, it's, uh, it's supposed to be raining all morning, and then it'll sort of clear out by uh, noon or a little bit after. So we're going to keep our eye on it. Right now, the 7 o'clock hour is about 20% yeah, chance of rain. Um, so either way, the grass is probably going to be wet out there. I'm going to encourage you to bring a chair, not a blanket. Uh, for all of those who are coming. Uh, there are places on the lawn that are marked out in paint. Uh, come set your chairs, uh, your family group around across there, and you can keep uh, social distance from one another. Bring your chair, bring your mask. We'll have booklets for you. We'll sing together, have a brief devotion, and uh, be home in time for dessert. It'll be great. Uh, looking forward to it. If something changes, if the forecast uh, drastically changes, if, if it's starting to look pretty stormy, keep an eye on your email. Uh, if you're on the church email list, we'll send something out to you. Um, and if need be, we'll also send out, you know, sort of an emergency text alert letting you know that it's been canceled. But if you don't hear from us, assume that it's still going on. We'd love to see you 7 p.m. tonight for our evening worship service, our sunset service of song, I think he's titled it. Uh, he said, is the alliteration too much? And I said, never, never, it's never too much. Uh, let's pray together, and then I'm gonna get out of the way. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty of this day. Lord, for the gentle falling of rain, for the promise of a new season that is brisk on the horizon. God, we give you praise and thanks. As we consider those in our families, in our neighborhoods and communities who are sick, who are hurting, who are recovering, who are uh, recovering from surgeries, God, we pray for your healing and your restoration. For those who are sick, those who are sick in their hearts, those who are ailed in their minds and their emotions, God, we pray for mercy and for healing. God, as we open your scriptures now together. We pray that your wisdom would be imparted to us. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see. Lord, guide us, direct us as we open your word together. And may you uh, use Brandon to speak your truth and your wisdom to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who's our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Brandon, your turn. Thanks, Rory. Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here for Sunday school. And I hope that many of us will be able to come out for the evening worship service today. It'll be nice to see people, even if we're wearing masks and um, kind of getting used to that at this point, probably. We are moving right along in the book of Romans. Um, so we're moving into chapter eight today, where we're going to talk about life and the spirit um, just kind of what that means, that transition out of what we've been to, what Paul's been talking about, uh, being in the, you know, in the flesh or, well, that kind of, that, that starts here, but being um, 
under the power and the corruption of sin that we all just inherited through uh, being descendants of Adam and then um, and then the law comes in and exposes this nature and things like that um, and then we're going to transition into what into into you know being in the spirit and kind of what that means not um, you know if when you get into what that looks like in practice you would probably want to read chapter 12 of Romans where Paul starts to spell out some of the behaviors um, specifically that are a result of being uh, led by God's spirit but we're just going to look at kind of the concept of what uh, that transition to life in the spirit today last week we stopped with Paul proclaiming that one could not achieve righteousness by depending on one's ability to fulfill the law. He explained that only by um, dying someone can be released from the power of sin and consequently released from the condemnation that came through the law's exposure of that sin. Uh, he described how the law failed to empower him personally to overcome these evil impulses that were within him and that you know, it only brought that impulse into sharper focus until it controlled him, even um, creating more sin within him, is the way Paul explains it. And then only through accepting the finished work of Christ and affirming it um, by faith can one die to sin and consequently die to one's captivity under the law. By sharing in the death of Christ through their baptism, Paul explains that um, the believer is released from the power and the penalty of sin, and then from the futility of the, of the life that is under the authority of the law. No longer would sin dwelling in the person control the person, as, it, as Paul described it, controlling him. Um, and so by uniting oneself with Christ, the, belief, the, the believer now has new life in the spirit. Um, before we read our passage, I do want to add something to last week's discussion. And his, so historically, there's been this tendency to view the law um, or obedience to the law within Judaism as merely a sort of works-based response um, to God's um, offer of salvation. The truth is, though, that New Testament uh, Judaism um, included a far more complex view of God's grace and benevolence than simply a work-for-a-reward type of uh, idea of salvation. The sort of that sort of rigid law versus gospel contrast um, that emerged out of the Reformation era, um, you know, it, it basically described New Testament Judaism just purely as this legalistic, uh, religious, um, you know, ordeal that really didn't, but it really didn't, that doesn't provide an accurate view of how the law was understood within Judaism at the time. Um, and so it therefore misrepresents um, the real situation behind the controversy that's taking place in the New Testament the, and the controversy that Paul is digging into. He's looking at it from the outside, but he's also telling of his own experience as a, as a Jew. And so if some scholars have pointed out the real question within Judaism at that time was not, you know, what must I do to be saved? They, they pretty much, that had been revealed to them. Uh, but rather the question for them, the, the, the way they were approaching um, living out Judaism and living out what it means to be God's people was who are God's people and how do you tell? Um, what does that mean? So that would be a, a better way of, of maybe kind of understanding the, the view of those, uh, the, the Judaism that we encounter in the New Testament. Uh, you'll see that it's that second question, who are God's people and how do you tell, that makes the best sense of um, Romans like uh, chapters 9 all the way through the end to, to to, to 16. The first question, what must I do to be saved, is clearly the important question, and, and it's at the center of Romans 1 through 8. But remember, Paul is working to show how the gospel brings both Jews and Gentiles together in God's uh, salvific act on the cross. Uh, with that perspective, the answer to that first question, what must I do to be saved, well, it's, it's, the, it's the same for everyone. It's the gospel. It's what God has done through Jesus. But, but when we're considering you know, the Jewish perspective in all of this, it, we don't wanna make the error of simply seeing them as a people um, devoted to earning their salvation through, through a works you know, reward type of program. That would be a very feeble generalization of, of a much more complex arrangement. Um, 
a strong awareness of God's grace and, and his undeserved benevolence was clearly understood within Judaism, but, but Judaism looked to the Mosaic law as the steward of God's grace and how one ought to respond to God. The stewardship of the Mosaic law is what defined and managed Israel as God's unique people. It was their adherence to the Torah uh, that identified them as God's people. For that reason, they prioritized a, you know, the doing of the law, and they set their minds to understanding how uh, they ought to apply the law to everyday living. You know, of course they did. Is this any different from how, you know, Christians throughout history have responded to the new covenant? It's not so different. We, we do the same thing. And, and how to properly interpret and apply the law um, ultimately led to, to all sorts of questions within Judaism. Many of those questions were answered differently by different uh, people and different groups. And so naturally this led to divisions within Judaism. And, and, you know, we see evidence of this in the New Testament when we encounter uh, different sectarian groups, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and, some of their, uh, and some of the contentions or the distinctions of their belief are even spelled out in the New Testament, such as the belief in uh, angels and the afterlife and things of that nature. But, in, you know, does this, doesn't this sound familiar? Um, have we not experienced this same type of development within Christianity throughout the, the, throughout the centuries? I also want to qualify a statement that I made last week where I described um, the Mosaic law as outmoded um, and an unnecessary reality for believers. Now, it was probably implied from the entire discussion, but I still want to qualify the statement by pointing out that uh, the Mosaic law is only outmoded in the sense that it has in fact been fulfilled you know, by Christ, and I, and I think we covered that. And what's unnecessary for believers is any attempt to look to the Torah um, the Mosaic Law as their authority, rather than understanding that by following the teachings of Jesus and through the power of God's Spirit, the believer is thereby fulfilling the Torah. That's that's Paul's teaching here in Romans, and and so I just wanted to make that clear in case I didn't last week. Um, so we're not talking about the nullification of the law; we're we're talking about its fulfillment. Um, and I wanted to give this follow up because it's significant for really understanding this new development in Christ where we see this decisive shift in the stewardship of God's grace. Um, a good, a, an actual good illustration of this in the Bible where we can kind of see it all kind of happen in one little passage is the story of the rich young ruler. Um, the gist of that story is after having um, kept the various commandments, Jesus mentions um, some specific commandments there. And after having kept those commandments, uh, the one thing that the young man lacked was to uh, forsake his possessions, uh, give them to the poor um, so that they wouldn't be a burden to him and go and follow Jesus. Um, so the stewardship that previously operated through the um, adherence to the Torah is now transitioning to and is fulfilled through allegiance to Jesus and the giving of God's spirit, which will actually allow believers to become the kind of people who respond to God in a certain kind of way. Um, it's that work of the spirit that is, uh, the, you know, the, in, in creating this new people that we're going to talk about today. So with that said, let's read our passage. We're reading from Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to read the first 17 verses, so verses 1 through 17. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of, de and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. 
So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. <clears throat> so here we finally come to this conclusion that Paul's been uh, getting at, the, 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 the central themes that, that have been brought up in chapters 6 and 7 where Paul took a, you know, kind of a slight detour to really um, to treat the threats of the, of the sin and the law and also explain the difference between the two. Um, in the first few verses of chapter 8, Paul provides a response to this plight of unredeemed humanity that he, he described in chapter 7. In chapter 7, he showed that as long as humanity was in solidarity with Adam, it was unable to do what God's law required because of the indwelling of sin. Paul then uses the rest of our passage to describe the new life that believers enjoy when they live according to the spirit uh, rather than according to the flesh. To live in the flesh just means to live under that um, condemnation and, uh, that, that came through Adam and its inherent corruption, uh, which the law then exposed. But believers in Christ find themselves in a new situation uh, that Paul describes. Consequently, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Um, so we'll just get into a little bit of contention right here off the bat as far as you know, biblical scholarship has, has noticed. Um, it might be worth mentioning here um, that in verse 2, the reader is confronted with this um, problem regarding Paul's use of the Greek word nomos, which is what he's, the, the word he uses for law many times, most of the time. He uses that same word nomos uh, to describe both sides of, this, of the situation here, uh, the law of the spirit and the law of death. Both of those are the nomos of the spirit, the nomos of the death. And, and most of the time when Paul is using nomos, he's talking about the Mosaic law. And so that's why, um, you know, if you weren't reading an English translation, translation and if you could read the Greek, you might have a little bit of trouble discerning, well, which one is he talking about? That's one, th that's, this is one of those areas where an English trans translation uh, does us some benefit uh, through lots of time and uh, you know, fault. They try to distinguish between things that are not so easily distinguished um, when reading in the in the original languages. A lot of time, a lot of times, the context will just settle the matter pretty pretty easily. But at other times, um, it, 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 it takes some work. It takes some thought. But any in any case, by law, does Paul mean the Torah, uh, the Mosaic law, or something more generic like principle or a power or authority? Um, to begin with, the law of sin and death clearly means the Torah, as it leads to sin and death. That's been the burden of much of Paul's emphasis uh, in, you know, in, in Romans um, from the get-go. But what is meant by the law of the spirit or the nomos of the spirit? When, when you're reading commentaries or if you were reading specifically on um, this question here, you'll typically be presented with two options that scholars have, have presented. The first is that when Paul talks about the nomos of the spirit or the law of the spirit, um, he's indicating the Torah in, he's, he's bringing the Torah into the realm of spirit, uh, where the Torah is experienced in its, in its, you know, fuller and truer sense, showing us God's intention to set us free in Jesus that, that, that the Torah is pointing to. The other option is that the word nomos or law for the law of the spirit is used not in reference to the Torah at all, but it's just used in a more generic way. It means the principle or power of the spirit, uh, describing the spirit's work of liberation. So the reason it's not immediately easy to figure out which way he's using it is because both of them have merit. Um, the first usage where nomos just is talking about the Torah, it's talking about the Mosaic law, that would correspond with Paul's previous observation that the Torah does in fact testify to God's righteousness, that it does uphold faith, that it does intend to bring life, and that it is ultimately a spiritual um, 
revelation from God that, that conveys a spiritual truth. Paul has made that clear starting in chapter 3 and in, into, in, into chapter 7. However, it would contradict chapter 8, verses, verse 3, where God, where, where God explains that he sent his son precisely because the Torah had no ability whatsoever to save. So Christ was sent um, among many things because the Torah was unable to save. And the second usage um, that nomos or me, you know, is, is being used more generically just to, just to talk about the authority or the power of the spirit. It fits better with Paul's overall teaching that no one is justified by the works of the law, that the righteousness of God is re revealed apart from the law, that uh, one enters the Abrahamic covenant by faith, not by the law, and that the believer is under grace, not law, and then finally the believers are released from the law. Um, all of those law, that, that's all nomos, so you can see how it might get a little confusing. Um, the second uses, usage is probably the most, is probably the correct understanding, since it's consistent with Paul's, you know, view of the Torah as being contradictory of the spirit and, and righteousness and faith, so it just, it, it meshes well with his overall understanding, even outside of the book of Romans. And, and Paul has also used this word at least one other time um, in a similar way. In chapter 7, he describes the power of sin um, as, a, as the law of sin when he's talking about the, the war within his members there at the end of chapter 7. So it's not, um, you know, it's not unprecedented that, that Paul has used this word in this way. Um, and so that seems to be what Paul is doing here as well. Um, he's using nomos in a peculiar way to explain how the spirit exerts this liberating power uh, through the work of Christ that takes uh, the person out of the realm of, of sin and the spiritual death to which it inevitably leads. Um, Paul then picks up this contrast uh, between being in the flesh and being in the spirit, uh, where the former expresses that initial condition that man inherits from Adam versus the new condition that is uh, given to those who are in Christ. In verses five through eight of our passage, he, uh, Paul presents a series of contrasts uh, between the realms of flesh and spirit, uh, which essentially gets at the orientation of a person's will. Um, he talks about living in the spirit, walking according to the spirit, um, and, things, and, and having them, a, 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 a particular mindset uh, he uses these, all of these ways of talking, contrasting between the flesh and that of the spirit. Um, each of the two realms are, are characterized by a certain mode of thinking um, and a certain type of lifestyle. The mindset controlled by the flesh ultimately leads to death, while the mindset controlled by the spirit yields up life and peace, is what he says there in verse 6. Um, and so, at the, you know, at this point, just in a, on an application level, it might be prudent to ask ourselves, you know, how are we forming our minds? What are, what are we putting into our minds? And what are we exposing them to? Um, it's a good thing for the Christian to consider on a daily basis um, since it is largely our mindset um, how we fulfill this obligation, how we walk in the spirit, and, and how that is actually, um, you know, our lives are characterized by that, how people can see that within us. Paul is not uh, issuing a warning here, though. He's simply making an exegetical contrast between those who belong to the flesh and those who belong to the spirit. This is how you can tell uh, both you as a person, you know, looking inwardly and then also as, um, as evidence to the people around you that something is different. He's talking to believers to help them understand their, their sinful state prior to coming to Christ and setting it in direct contrast to the spiritual life that they now possess. One of the primary reasons he's emphasizing this, is, and, and he, gets, he goes into this later uh, as the book goes on, is, is for the purpose of showing that only those who are oriented after the Spirit can have that you know, eschatological life that God has been promising um, since ancient times. Um, Paul makes it clear that to be in Christ is to be guided by the Spirit. They are one and the same, and you, you cannot achieve one without the other. They come as a package. Um, we may not always reflect the Spirit's authority in our lives, but it is a fundamental fact of our Christian existence, and it is the basis of our Christian life and, and, and living that life accordingly. Paul even comments on this situation um, in our passage here. 
uh, in which the Spirit's authority might not be so obvious. In verse 10, he points out how believers are still in these bodies that remain subject to, to death because of sin. The corruption and the mortality that was introduced um, by Adam's sin has not yet been fully eradicated. On the other hand, the believer's union with God or with God's Spirit gives life in the present time, and it is the presence of the Spirit that assures um, believers that God will give life to their mortal bodies destined for death, just as he raised Christ from the dead. Um, with this freedom from condemnation and the possibility of new life comes an obligation, Paul says. Uh, the obligation is not to the flesh or the power of, you know, uh, from which we've been delivered, but it's to the spirit. The consequence, he says, of remaining in the flesh uh, would entail that what living in the flesh has always entailed. It, it would mean death. Uh, the, the, the penalty is the same. And the sense of Paul's argument is that if, um, or the, yeah, is that if Christ lives in, in someone and if the spirit enlivens them, uh, then, you know, it's unimaginable for such a person to, to go backwards, to, to, to live in the realm of the flesh. Um, and so at this point, it's a little uncertain if Paul intends, uh, you know, to say that it's a genuine possibility for Christians that believers might return to the flesh and jeopardize their future salvation. But Paul is clearly affirming that to do so, uh, you know, would mean damnation. To continue to follow the authority of the sinful nature would mean what it has always meant, um, the death of, you know, spiritual death, in other words. And so there are some, you know, this, this passage will, will oftentimes pop up in discussions um, regarding um, can someone lose their salvation? Can you actually have salvation uh, and, and then lose it? Um, there are some who take this passage as well as, you know, the numerous other passages uh, of warnings that the Bible gives to believers as indicating that a believer can, in fact, make the choice to jeopardize their future salvation, even abandon their faith um, and cease to be in Christ. And then likewise, there are others who believe that this is not actually possible, uh, that the influence of the spirit in a believer's life is so uh, dominant um, that he or she can never actually reach the point of falling permanently into a lifestyle of sin and then therefore forfeit uh, the promise of the, 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 the no condemnation promise that we began with in this chapter. Um, you know, if you were to ask me personally, I feel that the Bible is, you know, really overwhelmingly clear that um, persevering as a Christian is at least in some small part uh, up to us and as such can be taken up or abandoned if we so choose. For me, the, the choice or, or the, the genuine presence of free will and humankind makes the best sense of, of scripture. Uh, the passages that provide warnings as well as those passages that, um, that talk of responsibility and, and the obligations that we have. I think we'll have an opportunity um, to dive into this further uh, at a later time uh, to, as, as far as talking about man's free will. So that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. And then, you know, actually, uh, we, me and Rory were talking about this earlier. It, 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 you could, it could really merit its own Sunday school lesson to, to do any sort of justice to discussing it and uh, looking at both sides. Um, so maybe that's what we'll do. Um, that, that could be interesting. I think it would be fruitful. Anyway, getting back to our lesson. Continuing in this flesh-spirit contrast, verses, uh, you know, 14 through 17 make, this, make a transition here. They uh, we're, we're going from the spirits granting life to um, this idea of, of adoption, of becoming uh, actual children of God. Those who are led by the spirit of God are also adopted as children of God, is what Paul tells us there in, in, in verse 14. Such adoption brings a, a new status. It, it provides an intimate relationship with God, and it makes you know, us believers co-heirs with Christ. Thus, the behavior of Christians is motivated and, no, you know, this change in behavior and all this, um, part of the motivation there is that, um, you know, we now belong to God's family. This is who we are. This is, we find our, our identity um, in God, in, you know, being uh, co-heirs with Christ and, and all that that comes with, all that that means. And so just as believers have been released from the dominion of sin, uh, through Christ and the power of the Spirit, 
so too does birth into God's family signal the, the potential for a radical break with um, you know, everything that's connected with our natural birth, the birth that we just came with. Yes, sir. Rory has ra raising his hand. Good question, Miriam. So Miriam's question, I'm not going to repeat it verbatim because I'm just unable, but I'm familiar, very familiar with the question. Her, her question is regarding the uh, salvation of all of those basically before Christ, those who, and specifically those who were following the Torah um, and, you know, trying, at, at least trying their hardest to be obedient to God um, in his revelation that was given to him. And that's really where you want to make this connection that, um, so part of the answer is kind of what we've already talked about. You want to make this connection where the Torah is not being nullified. It's not being discarded as if it didn't matter, it didn't accomplish anything. Um, because it has been fulfilled in Christ. And so you would really just, obviously these people did not know who Jesus was. They, they didn't have God's full revelation. And so we would be inclined to think that their faith, the faith that they were given, uh, the response to the grace and the revelation that was given to them, um, that is what ultimately gets them to salvation. Now the salvation that, that everyone has, past, present, and future, is always through Christ. It's always because of what Christ has done. But there have been times in the past leading up till now where revelation the revelation of god progressed and so those folks who didn't know about christ all they knew was the law um, their response to that would is is their salvation comes through their response to that but not because of the law or because they were able to fulfill it but because christ did it on their behalf so christ's um, um, accomplishing salvation for us transcends time and culture um, and and, and it spreads to everyone who is faithful to God. That's my best short answer. Um, so, thanks for the question, Miriam. That was a, that was a, that was a really good one. Um, so we're talking about adoption and being children of God, and how that is also part of uh, you know what motivates us in our behavior and 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 the change that uh, that takes place in our lives. Um, and so. Um, the imagery here of this adoption, it, 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 comes, it, it comes from the Old Testament, um, where God is pictured as the father of Israel, and Israel is, is, is portrayed as the son of God, and the individual Israelites are, are, talked, are described as being sons of God. Um, and since the Exodus was really the event where Israel was, was brought out of the land of slavery and made a son of God, uh, it might be that Paul is implying here that Christians have gone through their own Exodus um, by coming out of the slavery of sin um, through their baptism and their response and, uh, of faith and everything and, and are led by the Spirit just like Israel was led uh, by the, 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 the pillar of fire and, uh, and, and the cloud and fire in the wilderness. And this connection is also drawn by uh, or from Paul's description of the move from slavery to adoption, like when Israel was brought out of Egypt uh, into God's divine care. But there's also, a, you know, there would have been a more contemporary understanding of this as well for those Roman Christians that Paul is, uh, that Paul is writing to, who were either slaves or former slaves. You know, they knew all too well that slavery was a state of living death and, and what, what it meant to come out of that and be rescued from that or what it might be like that, you know, those who were, who were at the time wishing to be uh, out of slavery. So the natural consequence of, uh, of being adopted and, and all of these things that are taking place is that we're moved to, to call on God, Abba, Father, as it says here. Uh, believers are enabled through the, to, through the Spirit to experience the same kind of intimate relationship uh, to the Father as Jesus did, and, and Jesus called God Abba. Um, that's recorded in Mark chapter 14. Not only does the Spirit um, confer upon us this status of being God's children, he is also the one who, testifying with our own spirits, gives us the, 
um, certainty of knowing that we truly are God's dearly loved children. And, you know, this one in particular is something that has been such an enormous benefit for me personally. I am very much interested and in, in very, um, very much value um, the area of Christian apologetics, which is, you know, uh, providing sound arguments and evidences in, 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 for the Christian faith, for the truth of the Christian faith. Um, but at the end of the day, it's that testimony of God, that testimony of God's spirit to my own that, that gives me the security and the assurance that, you know, God loves me and that he has saved me through Christ uh, and that his spirit is with me always. So, you know, arguments and evidences and things of that nature are great. They're necessary. It's something that we as Christians should, uh, are supposed to, to do and we should be able to do. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we have the assurance of God's spirit who testifies with us, um, within us, um, of these things. And that's the game changer. That means the world. Paul concludes our passage with the understanding that our adoption is rooted in Christ's own sonship. So again, it's, it's Christ that has accomplished this. The, um, all of this is, is happening because of what he has accomplished on the cross. Our path has been set by him, and that path takes us, you know, under the shadow of the cross and, you know, potentially through many trials of despair as we track toward our final destination. As we're uh, going through life, um, you know, it's like Christ. He, um, you know, it ultimately led him through suffering and, and even death. And, and so we may experience the same. We may, it, it's, everyone's different, but we should be, we should understand that uh, trials and tribulations and suffering and things of that nature, they are not omitted because of our relationship with Christ. Uh, we, we follow a, uh, a savior who was crucified. Um, and then that reference to the, to the suffering is, uh, it, it's a, it really kind of springboards you into the following, the, the rest of the, the next passage in, cha in chapter eight, where Paul talks about Christian comfort uh, in the face of adversity and struggles and things of that nature. He can, you know, continuing on that same trajectory of life in the spirit, Paul assures the believer that God's spirit helps us through adversity and, and in our weaknesses, wh however, that might, um, however that might come about or, you know, those weaknesses might uh, show up. Uh, the spirit is there as well to help us and, and empower us and, and, and lead us through. So um, that's where Paul concludes our passage and that's where I'm going to stop uh, for today's lesson. But thank you very much for being here with me, and um, I look forward to uh, uh, the rest of the worship service with you guys. And hopefully, uh, maybe we'll get to see uh, see each other this evening um, if the if the weather permits. So um, don't forget to log out of this session if you're streaming, and and log back in for the uh, for the worship service. You guys, have a good day. Thanks.